And welcome back to Open Your Eyes. We are about to venture off into our first segment for the morning. ICJ Matters, the conversation has been extended. A lot of folks have been uh, actually been talking about it and we've got somebody in with us who, <laughs> in for galore, mm -hmm. Arjun Matura, uh, yes. uh, attorney at law, in to talk to us about ICJ. Yes. Um, trendy topic. Okay. Really trendy. I want to make certain declarations before I start. Uh -huh. One, I don't represent any organization. Mm -hmm. Two, I don't get paid by anyone to take my time out to do this, mm -hmm. which is very important in these days. Mm -hmm. Three, I don't believe that when I express my opinion that it's my duty to tell people how to vote. Mm -hmm. I really take issue with how the campaign has turned into telling people yes or no. Mm -hmm. And four, me sharing my view means that you could listen and decide for yourself. So those are important declarations to me. Mm -hmm. We can start from there. <laughs> so you don't want to tell people to vote based on your opinion? No, I don't think um, one of my biggest disappointment mm -hmm. was when the political parties decided to come out. Mm -hmm. I remember when the UDP made their first announcement, then the leader of the opposition made his personal declaration, mm -hmm. then he had to swallow up a little bit of his vomit and take his party position, then people are breaking ranks and so on. I'm like, then the referendum unit is biased. And now there is an NGO that was created for a political purpose, which I believe is illegal because our constitution and our NGO act specifically states what an NGO could do. And I know that because I had to go through the whole process. I took a lot of flagging mm -hmm. for being part of an NGO on a national issue. Mm -hmm. So from that experience, this, like, I'm really disappointed. And I think people are having the conversation, like everybody suddenly become attorney and have all kind of legal opinions. And I, I will speak about that too. But um, they're forgetting that there's something else before we get there. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at the issue, I look at it in two parts. Mm -hmm. There's the, the process that got us here, mm -hmm. or that is going to see it through. And then there's the actual appearance before a court, which is something totally different. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that what I've been hearing is like everybody mostly doing legal arguments. Mm -hmm. And I find that rather strange because... Let me, let me, let me just get in here because mm -hmm. I want to I understand, you know, Audrey, we know you to be very vocal on most national issues. Um, it has been quite some time before you came out with an official yes. position. And I know in, in, in uh, break time chat that you'd said you were going to stay out of it in the beginning. Yes. But now you've stepped forward uh, within the last month, putting forward a position of no to the ICJ. Yeah. What has led you to this point? Okay, at first, I really didn't want to get involved because I genuinely and honestly had hope that the conversation would have been one where we wouldn't have had these entities that are bombarding you as to how to vote. Okay. I especially am disappointed that an educational campaign turned out into a yes campaign. That is a major upset which I had hoped that it would have remained balanced, neutral, or just giving out information. But mm -hmm. having traveled <laughs> all over the country and many villages in the South, all the way up North, like I was in Liberty, um, Sartaneja this weekend, and the villagers were telling me, said, these people only came. It said, all they're telling us is, yes, they, this mm -hmm. the NGO, they said, and they show us the banner, and some say they're from the referendum unit, and people are confused, and they're telling me, imagine how um, they just came into our villages, they don't even know us before that. And all we hear is a yes campaign. And we, when we ask certain questions, mm -hmm. they're dismissive of us. Mm -hmm. And that is most unfortunate. You know why? Because having <coughs> been a person who advocated for a referendum, mm -hmm. I would have wanted that because you're given a choice, it's either yes or no, that you're given the information and you decide yes or no. Why would the government tell you we're going to have a referendum, but then turns around with a campaign and say yes, then you didn't have to have a referendum. Mm -hmm. What people need to understand, why this is part of the process. The government doesn't have to have a referendum to have the people decide whether we go to the ICJ or not. Mm -hmm. Many countries go to the ICJ. It is a political, governmental decision. They pass it through their parliament or whatever process they have in their respective jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and you go to, to um, the ICJ. This government could have opted to do the same thing. Like, I have the power. I can pass a, a um, legislation and take it to the ICJ. But I say, the minute you decided to have a referendum, this is not about legal arguments. This is not about who can campaign the best or not. This is telling people, look, you have a choice, yes or no. Mm -hmm. But the referendum is essential 
in resolving the Belize Guatemala issue. Any any resolution would have had to go to a referendum. Not not by law, not by law. There's nothing in our constitution, anything that says you had to go to a referendum. It is a political decision. I believe this is I my agree view. With you. I think this is my view, Marlene. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, sometimes I could be sinister about our leaders, yeah. especially our present administration. Going to the ICJ, like any litigation, has its risk. It's, an, it's unethical for the prime minister or any attorney in this country to have been telling people we have an ironclad um, case. That's not true. It's unethical, and I'll read you all the part of the law that makes it unethical. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, by saying you have a say, but yet ensuring that there's a yes vote at all costs, which is another issue I will discuss at all costs, mm -hmm. is then saying that I want to go, but I want to make it seem as though you told us to go. And when we, the risk does take place, I say, Pontius Pilate, see, I gave you all a choice. Mm -hmm. You all said yes. But then I'm saying you all haven't told people what our litigation risk, even if it's minimal. Mm -hmm. People need to know what if. And I'm saying this that's strictly professional, mm -hmm. because if I have a client and Marlene comes and says, you know, Audrey, I want to sue so and so, this is what the evidence is. But sometimes, many times, the person doesn't tell me a little bit of the detail or information that gives the other side an upper hand, mm -hmm. which is one of the issues is, as I to what the question is. The point that you're making is one of the consistent points that we've heard from many people, including an undecided panel that we yes. had on, on Monday, which is that people genuinely want to hear what the risks are mm -hmm. in going to the ICJ. Yes. But before we go through, I want to read you all the Legal Professional Act. We mm -hmm. have Code of Ethics, and that Rule 23 says, before advising on a client's cause, an attorney should obtain full knowledge thereof and give a candid opinion of the merits or the merits. That's very important. A candid opinion of the merits or the merits and probable results of pending or contem contemplated litigation. So you have to give probable results. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, it's ironclad. Then it goes on. An attorney should be beware of proffering bold and confident assurances to his client, especially where employment may depend on such assurances. Always bearing in mind that seldom are all the laws and facts in the favor of your client. And this is, the, I've read so many legal opinions and it's part of our profession that we have those and they're very good to have. But like Professor Vesiani said in his one, he says there are some risks. He didn't go into details and one of the cautions he said, you all go search everything the everything other side could possibly have. And that is very important because we don't know the question. Yeah. And, 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 and so the part we of We don't the, know the claim. No, we don't know the claim, sorry. Yeah. We don't know the, cl the claim because this question is so wide. Yeah. And let me tell you, part of it is why I would wish that we would have stepped back. Because the same people who are pushing it and both political parties were the diplomats who failed us in the negotiations, mm. were the diplomats who got us this special agreement, were the diplomats who, look what all has happened under that special agreement. Guatemala has changed mm -hmm. um, the date. It, for it, their it, referendum. It, right. Yeah. But it has a psychological effect. We should have both had it the same date if we, we would have wanted it. Why is it that we agreed to that? Guatemala then went ahead and, and pressured us. This is like really major. It's like one of the most upsetting things to me. The Guatemala went ahead and pressured us to change our referendum act. Listen to this amendment, mm -hmm. 2017. Like from then I became weary because of course I felt well, you had a, an involvement in the previous, in a previous referendum or attempt yes, at a referendum attempt. in Belize, and we do want to make that a, a part of the conversation. Which I could not meet the threshold. That is what I was going to get. I did so not. The I could not meet. Before, I could not meet the threshold for the petition because they went through all the signatures, and we, up to today they haven't shown us the signatures that they disregarded. Okay. Yeah. So here we have a government that I felt intentionally defeated the people's voice on an issue. But this one benefits them, but this one is worse. Mm. Because in 2017, they changed the law, listen. Who changed the law? The government, mm -hmm. here's a copy. It is number 20 of 2017 referendum act amendment. And here what it says, mm -hmm. before, before <coughs> you need to have a referendum, for it to be valid, 60% of the voting population would have had to come out and vote. And then the majority <coughs> from that 60% would have determined the issue. No, this is what they did. It said, for greater certainty, it is declared that the issue or matter submitted to a referendum shall be decided, shall mean must be decided by a simple majority of the votes cast. You know what that means? If a hundred people come out and vote, 
and six to say yes or six to say no, they carry the, they carry yeah. the decision. Mm -hmm. So what it was before, and I, I want to be clear because yes. we, we really haven't discussed yes. this in a long time since the actual change in the amendment. What it was before was that 60% of the registered voters yes. mm -hmm. had to participate, participate. Right. to validate right. an outcome of the referendum. Right. Okay. Right. So if you got 50%, if uh, I think we're at 140,000 around mm. there, uh, if it, it had to be 75,000, let's say, or 80,000 yeah. to come out. Participate right. and the majority of that ruling. But it was changed to say whatever number comes out, mm -hmm. a simple majority, whatever number comes out, the majority of that number has made the decision and, on behalf of the and country. And that makes me very weary because on a national issue mm -hmm. like this one where all the borders will be affected, where our sovereignty will be affected, you want the majority of people to come out. You want it to be uh, and literally a mandate that the people say it's okay. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other issue also related to this that people are not looking at. And that is that now we have a government with a referendum unit that has become a yes um, campaigners mm -hmm. who are gonna administer this referendum, who are gonna oversee this referendum having known their bias. That is why it was important for why them. Why are you saying the referendum unit will administer the referendum? It's being done through the elections and boundaries. Elections and boundaries. But remember, when you look at government, you look at all the entities as one. And mm. some of those same mm -hmm. people, like I've had friends that are getting letters that saying you will be a polling officer and whatever. So, so hear me out. Under the Representation of People's Act, mm -hmm. which tells you how an election how should an election be held, run, yeah. it makes no mention as to how a referendum must be run. Under the Referendum Act, mm -hmm. which tells you that basically what are the policies for a referendum, there's a provision that says the Governor General may make, may make um, regulations as to how a referendum must be done. Mm -hmm. That hasn't been done. Everybody well, ignore we that. We had a conversation with the Elections and Boundaries Commission mm -hmm. and, and officer here to get some answers to that very same uh -huh. question. Because this is a unique situation. Exactly. And we can't, uh, we can't uh, neglect to say that. Um, we've not had an independent referendum um, separate from an election. Yeah. And so I, I know that some of the changes um, specifically would be the inclusion of uh, monitors from entities that are represented in a National Assembly. So this includes the National Trade Union Congress of Belize, the Belize Business Bureau, the Belize Chamber of Commerce, the churches, and, and perhaps forgetting a few, but the exactly. other entities that are represented exactly. in but, the Senate. But where is the legislative amendment to allow that? You can't just do that. When you're a statute, a creature of statute, you have to go by what the statute says Sense. you can do. So that may be a novel idea of theirs. I don't know at the last hour when they will pass that amendment, but it was critical. Mm -hmm. It is critical because when you run an election, we, we have the blueprint how it's done. But when you are run, running a referendum, especially a referendum independent from mm -hmm. an election, mm -hmm. we don't have a blueprint. And the legislative amendments are not there. So you can't ask me to go vote in a process that I do not have confidence in. That is why I'm saying my concern is before I even reach the legal arguments that there's this entire um, method, step, process, procedure, transparency, and accountability in a system that is very lacking. Mm -hmm. And not only is lacking, I'm even more concerned that you don't require 60% of the voting population to go out and cast a vote for there to be a valid referendum. Mm -hmm. Do you that, that has to be an issue that p genuine, people genuinely concerned with this issue should be saying so this the is Belize a red flag. peace movement, which you are saying you're not aligned to, you said you're not aligned, not to, any aligned group, to any but movement. But the Belize peace movement is, a, is the pusher for the no campaign. They have put forward a suggestion saying to include specifically teachers um, from the Belize National Teachers the Union to be mm -hmm. informed, uh, to be included as monitors because they are independent mm -hmm. um, and the BNTU itself has not put forward a position of yes or no. Yeah. Do you support that? Would that make you feel more comfortable no. in terms of the no. autonomy of the process? No, no, I'm sorry. Um, I would want there to be an amendment to go back where you must have first 60% of the population. I would want there to be a proper debate as to what would be the best process because just saying ad hoc that let's just put this group or let's put that group, no. We've seen the churches come out with their position, mm -hmm. so we can even say we want them to participate. Thank mm -hmm. God the chamber at least, I don't know that they came out with a position. But I, I just think it wasn't something that you all, everybody comes out with a position. So I had held back my position and I had started off by being undecided and I'm like, let me see where this will go or how it go, what concerns me. And then, yes, it's more recent that I gave my position. Mm -hmm. 
and intentionally did not align myself with any organization or movement because I think that I want to represent the independence that they know we have a mind of our own, we have legitimate concerns. The fact that my position is no, I'm saying why my position is no, but I'm saying if you want to go ahead and vote yes, that's your that's right. Your right. Yes. But the, and sadly, the other thing that has happened, Marlene, and is that you go, you go and you make a position and the attacks you get. Yeah. I've been attacked by some of the most prominent people saying that I'm what? Fear mongering mm. and that I'm hysterical. Of course I went after them because nobody more <laughs> fear mongering and hysterical than them. Promoting themselves, Let pushing me. the agenda and forgetting that it's unethical as attorneys to say that you have an ironclad case. You don't have an ironclad case and you have not given the other side. Like I was at two forums already and the question comes up. Just in case, since you say we have an ironclad case, just in case, what if we lose or we lose something? What what will what you have in place? And they, the answer is very dismissive. No, 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 we know we know when we lose. We have an ironclad case, but a properly planned um, debate on this issue, a properly planned out method, process, procedure on this issue, or policies on this issue, the government should say, look, we believe we have a strong case. This is what I would tell my client. Look, I believe we have a strong case. But there's always these possibilities which we cannot tell because the reason we go to a court is because we're, we're having them decide an issue. If perchance this should happen, and that is we lose a part of the territory, let's just say that, mm -hmm. and you happen to be on that side, I want to assure you that these are your options. You still have the right to remain a Belizean. We can relocate you to another part of the country. We will help you get land. We will give you so much for, um, for no. you to start over. You know, just, just have a, have a plan. And some people, that's all they want to hear, too. I mean, to we, feel that there is a plan in place. That let it, me, let me just and, and you know what's amazing? That we're very dismissive at, of the common man. But when you talk to them and you hear them out, it's common sense. And another thing that comes out a lot, Marlene, is that distrust. A lot of people are going to vote no because there's just distrust. Imagine there's distrust because they see the same politicians on both sides hugging up each other. And then they're seeing that, yo, this doesn't seem like, why is it that they're pushing this so hard? Let why is it that they don't want to give us the other side of, this is what yeah. the people on the ground are And these are some of the things that we've heard from the <coughs> Undecided panel earlier mm -hmm. this week. But I just really want to go back to understand, uh -huh. because we, we, we appreciate you coming in and sharing your perspective. So as an attorney, as an activist, as somebody who had made a decision to be completely uninvolved in, in putting forward a position, what moved you from undecided to an absolute no? Oh, let me tell you what absolutely moved me was when I saw that the government could not answer to me or anyone, what if? I think that maybe because I, I think as an attorney, I want to go to my, my attorney and say, this is what I want. And that person can look at the balance and say, this, if you win, this is what can happen. Mm -hmm. If you lose, this is what can happen. Mm -hmm. And maybe they have an answer, but the fact that they refuse to say that to me, they refuse to give answers, and then they began becoming dismissive and began attacking. That mattered to me. It mattered a lot. As a, law, as a legal, pro legal professional, that was one of the factors. The other factor that was always at the back of my mind while I was trying to determine was, the Referendum Act, mm -hmm. that amendment. And as I learned more about the company and I saw all the different opinions and, and all the different players, I'm like, I do not have confidence that there's a proper procedure in place, that there's transparency and accountability, that it's gonna be a fair process. Mm -hmm. And I'm even more concerned now that here we have um, people who are taunting that, oh, definitely we go and we win. And you're not concerned about everything else that comes before we reach before the court. And like I've said, I've been to court many times some of my best cases on paper, mm. I've lost. Some of my worst cases, I've won. I mean, recently, I had an appeal before the CCG, and we had three points. And I was consulting with attorneys from the death penalty project. Mm. And there was this one point that was seemingly weak, because when we look at all the other cases and the rules on, of evidence, we were like, hmm, this is a stretch of the imagination. So I remember the attorneys, they say, do you think we should remove this third point? I told him, give me 24 hours to think about it. And I got up the next morning, I called him, I said, no, we shouldn't remove it. I said, because you never know what a judge will decide. You never know what bait they will take. 
we won the case on the very point that we opted almost not to. A, almost a foul. Okay. So, so, so I know how it could be. If we, and here we are going, people are saying, oh, it's going to be based on international law. But what they need to know is that international law doesn't follow precedent. It's not like our local laws that if they're saying, that it's most likely that on the issue of um, squatters, right, this is how it's to go, blah, blah, blah. It's mm -hmm. not like that. It's that they have, each case will be based on its own facts. They will apply certain principles of international law, but not because your case seems similar to the Belize case. It means it will go the same way. Andrew, but you, let do, me do you okay. believe that uh, some, of the, some of the folks right now who are a part of the yes campaign, they're saying yes, yes to the ICJ. Do you believe that some of these people know for the, in their mind want to vote no, but are just saying yes because they're actually uh, uh, riding this bike? Some of them, but not all. You know what's sad when I said that the political free should not have been involved, like the political parties? Mm -hmm. It's because some people are so fanatic <coughs> politically, they'll just go with what their party says. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember when I saw in San Pedro that Manuel Heredia not only gave an interview, but put up posters that said, definitely his constituency will, will vote yes. Like, really? There are so many people who will vote no that is so disingenuous. Mm. Say that I'm encouraging my, my followers to, to vote yes, but don't say definitely my constituency will vote yes. And that's mean you have no regard for the people who have, are saying no. Does that mean they're not part of your constitu constituency? Uh -huh. it, it's, really, it's really more political than national. Mm -hmm. And there are people who, who I've, I've heard um, being, have told me that they told them that if they don't vote yes, it means that Guatemala can invade us. And I have an issue with, th there's that little propaganda on, on the, the, the back street. There's, they're peddling that propaganda in, in some quarters. They won't say it outright. But I, I think the person who did say it outright in a way mm -hmm. was Sadi Elrington when he was saying we could become refugees in our own country, which which he's right, you know, but it's how he said it. But we've, we've heard we've heard on here as well on that um, on the show that if we, you know, and I and I and I hope I could say this out loud, that if we vote no, that to the next day Guatemalans or Guatemalans oil rig can come right there in front of San Pedro, uh, dig there, and there's nothing we can do about That's it. We've heard true. that on here. You're a steady no, but. Are you a no for no, no, none at all? Or would you like to see a few things get dealt with before you change your vote, if you should change Good your vote? Good question. I am not a no, no, no at all cost. Mm -hmm. This is my no. I want to see certain exchanges, but I would not want the referendum to occur in my, in my lifetime. Because I think that the same failed diplomats, the same failed politicians are pushing their agenda. A lot of them is about their egos because they were part of all of these negotiations and the failed negotiations. Put it aside. Put it to rest for a while. Mm -hmm. Give us a breather. It's like when, I, I don't know if you all ever gone through this, like you're in a family and you're quarreling, quarreling, and you're like, you know what? We're not getting anywhere. Let's take a break. I think we should step aside. You know, happens to the I family. Think, I, think <laughs> <laughs> I think you should step aside. And there are certain things that we have failed to do. Mm -hmm. We have failed to do the Sarasun Protocol. We yeah. have failed to recognize that even if we win, so let's say Belize wins outright, everything we say that is ours, it's ours. That doesn't stop the incursions by <coughs> Guatemala. We have failed ourselves. Both political parties have registered Guatemalans to become Belizeans. That, that we have failed ourselves. We need to step back, clear this, this process, Start afresh with new people. And let me tell you where we failed to. Mm -hmm. We failed to include it in our educational system. We failed, we knew we would be going to court and diplomacy was, was part of it. We've mm -hmm. never sent any diplomat to train that for diplomacy like other countries. They have trained diplomats at all level. I believe Guatemala out, outmaneuvered us diplomatically. That's what I believe. And, 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 do you believe? And, 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 and we knew someday we would go to court. We're independent since 1981. We've sent all kind of little cronies to go study law, but nobody has specialized in international law. Yeah. We have not intentionally created a cadre to say not, although we would use external attorneys, which I have no problem with. I like partnering because it brings a bigger um, focus and, and better expertise, but we should have had our homegrown ones, and we don't. And so then we are rushing it. It's like when you're going through a process and you just, this fails, so let's go to the next one, next one. No, sometimes you have to step back. Clear the drawing table and say, you know what? Some of us are too close to it. Those same five, who were those five foreign ministers? All failed us. Dean Barrows, Said Musa, Lisa Schumann, um, Glenn, I uh, know, Godfrey Smith, mm -hmm. and Anasar Schumann, who gave up Belize. 
is here only, is here, he doesn't live here. He's only here doing this and formed an NGO. Uh, this year, formed an NGO to push this, like, what is with that agenda? Me, Even if it's nothing yeah. sinister, <coughs> optics are important. It is important to show that you're, you're doing things fair for all, not let bias. Just, let me just tell you a bit of what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing from you sounds very similar to what we have heard from a former foreign minister, the only one who didn't sign the declaration, Eamon Courtney, in talking about what he called the deep freeze. He proposes a certain number of years, but for the very same reasons that you're saying, that we need to prioritize uh, our own diplomatic exactly. stance, um, perhaps leave this issue um, until fresh blood, he called it fresh blood, or new persons, or persons yeah, who have not grown up in this era. So you would, you would say that you support something along those lines? I support something along those lines. And remember, you asked me if it's an absolute no. At that time, when we then have to make a decision whether we want to go to the ICJ or not, it may be that we had resolved it diplomatically because it's a whole new era. Remember, we don't, I want to see which diplomat in Belize can come and show me that they are specialized in diplomacy like in other countries. They don't. We take somebody we like and mostly attorneys and say, oh, make now diplomat. Yeah. We, we attorneys really think, we're full of ourselves. We think we know it all. That's, you, why, you we, that's that. why we are at the forefront saying yes. We're so full of ourselves. I, 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 I want, uh, one more, I, okay. I do you believe. Now, we've heard so much, and, and, and it's actually scary to know that uh, uh, our international friends would turn their backs against us. That's no, what they said. Hold on, hold on, hold on. So I want, I, want, I want to ask you, do you believe that if we go to the referendum on mm. April 10th and we vote no, mm. will these people actually turn their backs against our country, no help to our country, and that's it for Belize, you are on your own. Do you believe this? No, I don't believe that. I don't believe why that. Not? One, one, I don't believe that because one, they're not helping our country anyway. Please tell me who's helping our country <coughs> except for Taiwan here and there. Mm -hmm. So, two. Well, a lot of our projects are funded by external. Two. Yeah, but they're sources. not governments. They might be IDB or whatever banks. Two. If there's, there's this friends of Belize that has some yes. kind of interest that we can't get up to today, who all are the personalities behind it, that should concern us because that sounds more like business interest. Mm -hmm. They make sure that they have business interest in both countries. But because I don't know who they are, and they've not declared their vested interest, and most likely they are the funders behind this NGO, mm. that should concern you. And, and you wake up the following day and people voted no. So our borders doesn't suddenly erase. Um, so they don't suddenly take down our flags at the United Nations. It, we, doesn't, we don't suddenly disappear. We remain a sovereign country with the right to have decided. John, if these people, if government really believed that that's what would have happened, then don't have a referendum. Do not have a referendum. Tell the people, I believe I have a an ironclad case and I'm taking it to the ICG. But the minute you have a referendum, please keep this in mind. It's like almost like an election. Either you choose this politician or you choose that, that politician. politician. In this case, you're choosing yes or no. So you're telling me I have a choice. I can vote yes or no. But because I vote no, suddenly I've created all this problem for my country that don't give me the choice. Yeah. Just tell me what you want to do. And, and, and to me, like, the debate had become, I, I read some, some of the comments like, oh, everybody we had a legal opinion and a legal argument. And, and I'm thinking, wow, amazing. How do we not step back and realize before we even reach that debate, what is it that we have? Why are we going there? How are we getting there? Do I want to participate in this process? Is it transparent and is it, are they being accountable? I want to know that when I vote, since you told me I have a right to vote, I'm participating in a fair process. And to me, the first step of unfairness comes mm -hmm. when you change that referendum act and you're saying it's not 60% majority that should decide, it's the bare, the bare minimum, a simple majority of whoever comes out to vote. And, and that brings us to another thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you all have gone to the registration offices or I scout have. them. Yes. Very worrying. Very worrying to me for several reasons. Like I had to wait to go register. I was one of those that registered it because I was waiting for a document that has to do with my name change. Okay. I wanted to have my ID in my, my correct name, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to fix that. So I went when it was late and I visited and I interfered at other places. And I was amazed what people were commenting after. Like some were saying they're frustrating me from registering. Some people upset that they can't, well, they don't own a passport. We are, I'm amazed how many Belizeans don't own a passport. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't get my, my, my um, 
birth certificate. I don't have a valid social security, which I didn't realize my social security card expired too. And like all these frustration, and, and I, when one of the divisions, the lady went as far and said, I tell you, they know I'm a no vote. They know I'm politically aligned to the People's United Party. And I feel that they frustrated my ability to vote. And then she began pointing out, you see, this one is that, so this is a small community. This one is the one, and then they say, see, that one is from the minister, and watch how they bring people. And so it's, why do we have to do that? Like, why, so can't, we, can't, why can't on this one issue allow everybody to register? And remember, what, I, I was amazed when, I, I don't want to call people names, <laughs> but when certain personalities went on Facebook and said, oh, people uh, register late, no. Look at it differently. Since 20 years ago, the government should have done re-registration. Mm -hmm. Then when every 10 years, and then they pass another law saying, we'll put it off. And now just months before a referendum, you do re-registration, and you are making sure you're bringing out your people, disenfranchising others, disenfranchising those in the diaspora. Don't you all see something flawed with that system? Let me, I, I want to, because I know we're, we have a lot to cover, yes. and, and there are certain points that I just, I want to get your response on. So you speak of not necessarily being an absolute no right. um, in, in, in the fact that you simply feel that there are thing, other things that need to be done before we move forward in this process. So I want to give you, because we've asked this question, mm -hmm. obviously, uh, to the referendum unit, to the yes campaign, to the other people who are involved. Mm -hmm. And their primary answer is that it is an opportunity <laughs> that we are not sure we'll be able to get again. And I want to explain why, instead of just saying it that way. Because this is a scenario where you need agreement from both countries. And so we have our negotiating partner or, or uh, agreeing to going to, to going to court under the terms that we say we want. And we're not sure if we're going to be able to get that opportunity again. How do you respond to that? I would say I would want to buy their crystal ball from them. <laughs> because when the British tried to take Guatemala twice to the court, they didn't think that it was an opportunity that we'll ever have then it means that we don't have competent leaders that feel that at a later date we will have had citizens that were raised to even negotiate an even better agreement and that's such a wide question. I don't agree with that. Let me tell you why I don't agree with that too. Strictly speaking legally, a court will always be there. It's not as if we don't go to the ICJ this year, 20 years from now it won't exist. I mean the world would have had to come to an end and it doesn't mean that we can't ever go back and negotiate. It's like, it is an ever evolving thing. If yeah. that, that argument doesn't hold, because if you go back to where we were before, who would have thought we, we'd reach here? And that's why I'm telling you, a lot of it has to do with the egos of the same failed diplomats who want to push it now. And, and, and they think this is the best agreement? Well, let me tell you, like I wrote up all over it, but let me tell you, how could we say <clears throat> it's the best agreement when I don't believe that we well, this is being challenged, and that's another question that I have. Yes. And I want to ask you what, what your thoughts are on the, the current legal <laughs> you know, challenge before the finish. court. You know? Yeah, I know, because we're running out of time so quickly, and we won't like be able really to get fast. them addressed. Yes. yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly, I'm just saying, a lot of things that they had negotiated, Guatemala has gotten a lot of it changed. We haven't gotten any of it changed. Wow. So much. So much. See, there are amendments. There are amendments that were made. So much for such a great document. Mm -hmm. So what about the legal challenge? <laughs> Honestly? I can't say they will win it, I can't say they will lose it. It has arguable merits. I read it, I was really taken aback when I read it and I'm like, man, this sounds like something Anthony Sylvester thought up. Because he's, he's very good at looking constitutional law mm -hmm. and looking at little twists and turns. And I saw he, on board, I was surprised to find out that on board is also Eamon Courtney, Dickie Bradley. I don't remember who are. Harry Musa. Harry they Musa. Have to put it mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think Dean Molina as well. So they are, and, and those are people that I know look at things and argue all kinds of directions, which is what attorneys do, you know. So when I it's read interpretation. It, yes, when I read it, I'm like, damn, you know, that does have some merits. Will they win it? I don't know. It's just like the ICJ issue. When we go to court, will we win it or not? But it is worth it is worth the challenge because technically, when you look at it. Once the court decides <clears throat> a ruling, so let's say they make a ruling and they change somehow our boundary. That is what they're, they're the technically... ICJ. The ICJ. ICJ. If we vote, yes. yes. If yes. we go to the ICJ. And, and let's say one of the risks is that we do lose a portion of beliefs, uh, be it only a mile. It does change the boundaries according 
to this treaty. Which is their and so technically, argument. technically they can then change. They're technically changing our constitution. So I do believe that there are processes that should have been in place. Should that happen? Okay. I mean, which tells you. You know what it tells you. What this shows you that when it comes to law, nothing is certain. Mm -hmm. So you can't come and tell me we have an ironclad case. We'll go and we'll win. You have to say, look, these are all the possibilities, but. We have a 75% chance of winning. Give people an idea. Knowing that you're taking a 25% risk, it doesn't mean you will lose. It doesn't mean you will win either. But know that there is risk. But don't worry. If there's this risk that happens, this is plan A, plan B, Having plan C. It, that plan that makes sense. That is the responsible things leadership should do. Mm -hmm. So. You spoke of, of ha not having a problem with us uh, having a foreign um, law firm uh, taking <clears throat> up the case or, or heading Partnering the case. Partnering with us. So there are legal opinions that have been produced over the years, the most recent yeah. being by Professor Vassiani. Yeah. What are your, I mean, these, even the, the legal opinion from uh, the Guatemalan side have said that we have a strong case. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? If, if we, if you do agree that having external opinions and external mm -hmm. consulted consultations, mm -hmm. um, that is essentially what these legal opinions are. Right, and, 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 those legal opinions are based on one thing which is not in this this book. Okay. Those legal opinions are asking you to interpret a treaty. Mm. Remember, mm -hmm. this question doesn't say that we are going only on a treaty. We don't know what their claim will be. We don't we you think Guatemala is de facto taking over Sarstoon for no reason. There are principles in law when you go effectively try and take control of a place. Yeah. We don't know what has been the level of response from our government diplomatically because the way we respond helps to push that back. We know there have been in incursions on our side of the border. Yeah. But what did we do? When our BDF lawfully shot at one or two Guatemalans and have killed them, we turn around and compensate them and we'll castigate our people. When our Belizeans who are from the Belize Territorial Volunteers go to our waters, we're castigated. I've been one of those who got, went there, you know. I went there on one of the occasions and I when remember- the group was taken to Livingston? No, uh, no, I was in that group. I was in the group where Wilma here said, watch right now, let's pretend we are fisher folks. Good for we were in the mud and whatever, because there was a lot of mud. He says, watch how they will chase the, the BDF. And so said, the Guatemalan um, military just began chasing the Belizeans, the BDF, and when that happened, we got an opportunity and we took our boat and we sped to the island and we put up a flag. Mm -hmm. I still have that historic picture. Yeah. It was uh, like seven of us and we put up that flag. And so of course, eventually they, they took it down. But what I am saying with this whole thing that, um, what the legal, what opinion the legal opinions are, when a client comes to me and just gives me a certain thing, I will base my legal opinion on that. If you read Professor Vassiani, he gave a legal opinion on interpretation of the treaty. I am saying, <clears throat> because the question is so wide, nothing here says that you're going to decide it only on a treaty. Let me tell you, I could come back, I could come back after they filed their claim and I've read their claim. And then I could say, oh, it's because this so, is the so, craziest so thing. Ask you, We're going so to court and we don't even know so what the claim I will be. You, <laughs> Um, what your personal <coughs> thoughts are on the strength of the case of Belize, mm -hmm. you would say you need to hear the claim first? Yes, I would need to hear the claim first because I'm telling you, I've done it as an attorney, especially as a constitutional law attorney. I have pulled out of that hat of tricks principles that the other one didn't even expect. I'm doing a case, a constitutional case right now, first, first of its kind. So. I'm challenging certain things that the other side doesn't even expect that I'll be challenging, mm -hmm. challenging that. Mm -hmm. Because that's the nature of law, Marlene. Yeah. We don't know what all they would put in. And sometimes, like I said, the very point you think is the, the weakest turns out to be the strongest. Longest it has point. happened to me so many times. And it was and how based do you on interpret the response when, when we are told that the inclusion of the any and all is simply to ensure that there is finality to this issue with an ICJ ruling. I think that's a cop out because either we know if we are going to diplomat, if we are that savvy diplomatically, either we know what is it that they want up front, mm -hmm. why give them free reign? I don't believe that, that that's that was the best way to go. I would have wanted it narrowed down. I know some of my seniors have said otherwise, but that's your me, your legal opinion. Me as a junior, I said no. I want to go to court knowing what my, my claim is that I'm facing. Mm -hmm. I want, and this that, um, and this that it will include all and any, so I don't know that they have more than one claim against Belize. 
So have we now given them the opportunity to make more than one Well, case? it has changed over years. We, we are aware Exactly, of that. but it has changed over years, saying how much of the country they want. So let them tell us from now, what? when you claim, what are you asking for? Are you asking only for a road that you said you were to get in the 1859 treaty? Or are you asking for half of the country because you believe that in the, the agreement that we previously had that involved Mexico, that <coughs> this half would have gone to Mexico, to Mexico and this half? Uh, uh, what are you saying? Yeah. I believe that when sometimes you go too overconfident and cocky and say, man, I'm so sure, give them what you want. And you don't know what the other side brings. Mm -hmm. Guatemala would not have agreed to come this far and finally go to the ICJ if they were not on a better footing. Watch what Guatemala did, which is what we should have done. When the British tried to get Guatemala to go to the ICJ, they said no. But they have since strengthened their position. They have established themselves diplomatically. They have made sure that they have their own in-house trained people. They have made this one of their number one issues, how they go ahead when they negotiate and everything. Mm -hmm. And not only that, they are relaxing now because we have allowed Guatemalans to come in and be uh, nationalized. We have failed to deal with the incursions. We have, they have pushed themselves on the Sarsun. We have failed miserably. Let me tell you, I always tell clients, and this happens sometimes, mm -hmm. I, like especially in land matters or family matters. You come to me and you say, you know, I want a, a divorce. I'm worried that I won't get custody of my child. Mm -hmm. And you tell me the whole thing. I say, okay, Marlene, let me tell you what you'll do. This is not the time to go to court. You will go now and you'll make sure you get a job. You will, you will go get to the doctor. Order. You, and by the time we file, it's because Marlene will win, most likely win that case because she, the things that the court are asking for, she already she has already her has ducks them. in a row. And that's, I think that's what Guatemala did to us. But we're so cocky we're so myopic we're so egocentric mm -hmm. that we must go now but remember what i said why do you think that is do you think that is or uh, we're being cocky because of the uh strength of the 1859 treaty no i think because personalities have gotten in the way instead of national interests. Mm -hmm. Remember I said, we can always go to the ICJ 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now, mm -hmm. but we would go on a stronger position. We would get our borders in order. That's our student protocol, which I know Eamon Courtney and at least Lisa Schumann had been saying that, I mean, her position was until we have that, I wouldn't vote. Yes, she says I would vote no, and then she changed, and we don't have that protocol yet. So then, hmm. but what, 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 she, she actually one gave things. eight points of to do, and none of them has been done except the re-registration. Mm -hmm. And the re-registration at this late point. So remember, I know you're asking me a lot about the legal issues, but before you even could consider all of that, what is it that is happening on the ground to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to be registered? You, you have to extend that registration, especially when you had to close down vital statistics where people were looking for their birth certificate so that they could go and register. It's unfair. And it's not, and, and I want to move away from the legal issue for, for at least uh, the final question at this point, or for me. Um, you see, clearly, since you've been um, public about your no position, how vile the conversation is yes. at this time. Yes. And it is for, I think it's very concerning for people who've not made a position. Yeah. Um, sometimes turning off some people from even participating in the discussion or asking the relevant questions. Um, when you step forward as someone who declares a no position, what is your goal? If you're not telling people to vote no, what is your goal? I, my goal is to tell people to be emboldened, to think it through for yourself and not be afraid to take your position. I will take a tax on my position, but let me tell you, if a colleague of mine, and I've had people who come to me and say, you know, I am a yes for so-and-so reason, and I say to them, that is your right. Mm -hmm. And some of them are not saying yes for any of the legal opinion. Here, amazingly, some of the men on the street that say yes to me, have said yes to me, they say, you know what, I just want to get over it. I just want to get over it. So they don't even put a full thought process into it, and I'm saying, you know what, it's a referendum. He or she has the right to feel that yeah. way, because it will be based on some feelings. Yeah. And I've had people that come and tell me plain, I'm undecided. I'm undecided, and they say why I'm undecided. And, and amazingly, one of the reasons that people feel undecided is they're saying like, I just feel that they're rushing it. And I'm wondering like, part of me is saying, you know, it might be good to bring it to an end, but part of me is like, why are they acting like this? If we're so sure, why is it that I feel pressured? 
and why they attack. So people are so, are, so when I give my uh, my my position is so that people know like hey there are different spectrums of yes and no. Of course, you don't yeah. have to fall into everything. It's well, not always a clear cut yes. It's not a clear cut no. no. But let me assure you, whether it is yes or it is no, you have that right to make that choice. If it is no. Belize doesn't end the following day. Guatemala can't invade us the following day. If it is yes, then let's get prepared for the, there's going to be a process. It will take four to five to six years before they, there can actually be a hearing, which, and it will involve some money. So our government need to tell us where we will get that 20. Roughly, I was told it's about 25 million. I don't know if it's US or Belize dollars. So we prepare for what will, will happen there. We, th you have to get the country prepared if, if that's the way we'll go. And for some reason, they don't want to do that now. They want you to blankly vote yes. So maybe by saying no, one of the things I'm hoping is that, you know what? Let us sit back and then we get an opportunity to clear this up and get a second bite at the cherry at a later date. There's no way of saying that Guatemala will never want to go at the ICG again. There's not, you, you can't say that, that, that the crystal ball doesn't exist that shows that. But people say we are look bad. We, are, we, we, we must go now because we want to look uh, bad internationally. Let me tell you, we don't they look bad. We don't they look bad when we disenfranchise our voters. We don't they look bad when we track back and we allow them to have their referendum before us. We don't they look bad when we change our referendum act to suit them. If you could go back and find the news clips mm -hmm. where the Guatemalans were pressuring that we change the threshold. Mm -hmm. We don't they look bad. You think that was... That was good diplomacy that we give in to them. They cannot tell us what to do in our laws. Why did we change our laws to suit them? We didn't tell them how to hold their referendum. Mm -hmm. We so didn't tell them what threshold to put. We didn't tell them anything. So why can they pressure us into doing that? So you have to think that it could never just be a clear cut yes or no for some of us because we think beyond mm -hmm. just people pressuring us to say yes or pressuring us to say no. I have said my reasons why I'm voting no. It has been a well thought out process. It has taken me a long time to decide whether to say it publicly. I've been invited to many forums that's how long before I've said no to all of them. Mm -hmm. Until recently, I said yes. And I knew I said yes at the, at the cost of incurring a lot of wrath from the political parties. Let me tell you how bad it is. I went to a BNTU presentation, and me, in my bold way, will say what I have to say. And mm -hmm. I will come with my facts. I read them, the things that I had to read. Mm -hmm. The following day, on the government media station, they tear into some of the nastiest things. That is the price I'm prepared to pay because that shows you the level of ignorance we're dealing Let with in this country when it comes to a national issue. But yet you tell people you have the right to say yes or no. But if you don't take their position, you become wrong with the you. object yeah. of attack. Yeah. Yeah. That's how bad it is. Let me ask you one <coughs> final question um, because we've seen where conditional no's have shifted uh, over time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that could change between now and April, April 10th, 10th that would make you vote yes instead? No. No. You stick to that, no. I'll stick to that, no, for now. I can't see them that from now to then, they put in place the legislation or they make the amendments to make the diaspora be part of the vote. I think they should be part of the so, vote. A lot of the people who left this country and were forced out of this country, it was as a result of the heads of agreement, their position they took. There are a lot of Belizeans abroad that sacrificed for this country, yeah. and the fact that they're not here doesn't mean that they shouldn't vote. And, and all of that disenfranchisement, and you realize why I go back to the amendment to the referendum, what they did, they got the bare minimum, the bare minimum that they can control. These political parties have it down to a science, you know. I was involved in them. I can tell you how they calculate how many households and how much votes they need. They have it down to a science. I was told by a colleague of mine, mm -hmm. and a well-connected UDP said, I <coughs> hope you realize that no matter what you say, it's a yes at all costs. That's what I mean by that. It's a, just be sure that when the ballots are counted, you will see it's a yes, no matter who is saying no. So I will wait and see that prediction. Well, we, we don't have the crystal <coughs> ball as yet. And <laughs> exactly. So we will be able to see what happens. Uh, just yeah. to be clear, so no position from what I've heard from you today is um, perhaps the first and primary point is based on the change in the Referendum Act. Mm -hmm. Secondly, because it has been a one-sided campaign. Am I missing any? The Sarsoon protocol and our diplomatic positioning has not been optimal. I mm -hmm. think primarily it's the, the way the government has managed the whole process. We have an agreement that the Guatemalans get to change, but we don't change. Mm -hmm. We have legislation that we change that disenfranchise some of our people. We have a government that refused to tell us what if. That is important. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can't just 
listed like that. It's like a series, a combination yeah. of things. So the way I would list it is that there's I have issues with the process, the procedure, the transparency, the fairness of the process that will go into us going into a referendum. Absolutely. So that, Thank you. Because it, it involves a lot yeah, of... To clarify yeah. that. Thank Andre, you too we for always having me. love having conversations with you. We love appreciate it, you it. coming in oh. and sharing your thoughts. And on I brought ICJ. so many more things I wanted to read so that people know that I'm not talking off the top of my head. Well, we appreciate you for what you contributed this morning. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by the founder of the Tyler Savory Foundation for talking about the third annual Light Our Hearts Rally. Please stay tuned.